Exodus chapter 8. And let's begin, first of all, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Jump down to verse 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron, and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes? And will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice. Uh, and Pharaoh said, I will let you go. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed part of that verse. We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, we will let you go, uh, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from the go out from thee, and I <clears throat> and I will um, here I here get the same problem I had last week, and I will entreat the Lord that he that the swarms of flies, which they had already been suffering that, may, be, may depart uh, from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people tomorrow. But let not the uh, Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And, uh, <clears throat> and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time. Also, neither would he let the people go. That phrase, God the Lord did, verse 31, the Lord did according to the word of Moses. How'd you like that to be said of you? The Lord did according to the word of Hudson. The Lord did according to the word of Jehan. Can you imagine being that close to God um, in chapter 7? It was obvious that Moses was the highest authority in the world at that moment. Beside God in heaven, Moses was the highest authority on the earth. And uh, he had... Um, invested so much uh, rule and command over the children of Israel in Moses that um, he was the go-between. He represented God to the people and the people to God. It's hard to imagine anyone having that kind of, I hate to use the word clout, <laughs> but authority with God so that God could very easily say he did according to the word of Moses. And yet, he was. He was the highest authority on the earth at the time. The old TV game show, Let's Make a Deal, has been on television in some iteration for almost 60 years, 58 years. And it's been hosted by different uh, comic game show hosts, um, Monty Hall was the most famous in the 70s and 80s. Uh, comedian Wayne Brady hosts the show now, I believe. And the premise is contestants dress up in crazy, wacky costumes and go to the TV studio hoping to impress the judges um, 
and they get chosen to be on the show. And um, they can barter and trade and pick prizes that are offered. And if they pick something good, great, they can hang on to it. But later on in the show, they'll have a chance to trade up to something much better. Now, if you're not too greedy, you'll do all right. Near the end, they have sort of a, a three curtain showcase, uh, curtain one, two, and three. And uh, you have a chance to choose what's behind one of these curtains. Now, it might be a great prize. You might have had a, a flat screen TV early in the show, and they give you a chance to choose a curtain. And uh, behind that curtain may be a new car, uh, or it may be a very expensive vacation around the world. Or if you're too greedy and you can't tell yourself no, you might choose something that turns out to be a zonk. A dead, you know, worthless gift, a bucket of bananas, something that nobody wants, nobody needs. I got to thinking during pre preparing this, I wonder if those people who get the zonk actually keep the bananas and go home with the bananas, or if it's just a, for gags, for joke's sake on television. But I call this sermon, Let's Make a Deal. This sermon, Let's Make a Deal. The Lord sent Moses to speak to Pharaoh, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. Um, but Pharaoh refused to let the children of Israel go uh, unless he could attach some conditions to letting them go. Um, and God sent God had to send plagues to get the Egyptians' um, attention. The Bible says in Exodus 1, verse 8, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Israel had been in bondage 400 years um, by this time. And um, they, the king who ruled over Egypt, when Moses came into the picture, may not have been a native of Egypt at all. Some speculate this might have been what's known as the Hyksos dynasty, H-Y-K-S-O-S, -S, uh, thought to be a Phoenician or a Palestinian kingdom that uh, had the strength uh, and the force, or the strength and the determination to go to Egypt during their days of turmoil and uh, conquer the capital and take over the kingdom. And that may, in fact, be uh, who was ruling over the kingdom and the, the reign uh, of the Pharaoh when, um, when this story takes place. Um, but um, Pharaoh had conditions uh, to letting the Israelites go. I'll let your people leave, but um, first let me let me get this assurance from you, or let me get this promise from you. And uh, he always he, he wanted to add something onto it, uh, and Satan does that. I'm going to try to illustrate that point as we go. The Bible tells us in the New Testament now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the worlds are come. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. The things written in the Old Testament, the stories of the Israelites, the stories of their troubles, the story of their experiences, uh, are all written and recorded for us for our benefit today. The idea, you know, the Church of Christ, they believe the New Testament is relevant, but not the Old Testament. They very rarely mention it. Well, they're ignoring the plain testimony of the New Testament that those things written for us before 
were written for our benefit now. So they're neglecting a big part of the Bible by only emphasizing the New Testament. Now, Egypt was a great picture of the lost, unsaved world in which you and I live. The world of corruption, the world of crime, the world of vice, and the world of treachery, the, the, the world of deception, and uh, the world of immorality, the world of theft, um, perversion, the, the world of murder, and violence of every kind. That's what Egypt was a picture of. And um, in, in a way, that's what the United States has become a picture of for decades now. I was telling a couple of brothers just a few minutes ago, um, and I won't mention political parties and I won't mention political names, but I want one candidate to win uh, the election coming up soon, and I want their party, his party, to become so dominant that they steamroll over the other party and uh, wipe the other party out so that it takes them 30 years to regroup, collect their forces again. Uh, and um, those that remain, um, I want them to become so despondent they jump off a bridge. That, that would be a good outcome. All right. But let me describe some of the deals Pharaoh offered to make with Moses. Deal number one, uh, why not just sacrifice here? Like at, um, well, we, I was going to say verses 25 to 27, but we don't need to read those three again. Pharaoh said to Moses, uh, let's make a deal. You just uh, serve your God, but you don't have to go very far. You don't even have to go anywhere. You do it right here. And spiritually, Satan tries to make believers um, compromise with um, the world, compromise with God in some way, some fashion. And um, Satan will say, go ahead, you can be a Christian, just uh, keep it quiet. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. You can do it right here, and um, everything's just fine. But Moses refused Pharaoh's deal, and he refused it for two very good reasons. Number one, their sacrifice of their cattle uh, and their livestock and their herds would have been considered uh, an abomination to the Egyptians. Egyptians uh, revered animals as sacred, uh, just as the Hindus did at the same time. The cow was very sacred. You recall the Israelites um, leaving Egypt under Moses. They got discouraged there in Exodus 32. Moses is up receiving the commandments from God, and they're down, down below near the plain, making a golden calf to worship, because that calf symbolized, represented various Egyptian deities. It's funny how certain things were consistent in the ancient world. A thousand years before Christ, Hindus were uh, regarding cattle as a sacred animal. I think they regarded the cow as more sacred than even the Egyptians. But um, even today, you see fat cows, or at least healthy, alive cows, roaming the streets of India, unmolested, untouched by the people, because they consider that the embodiment, the, the highest um, um, deity in their Hindu pantheon. Um, so people are starving, and uh, bathing, people bathing out in the uh, Ganges River, just the most sewage-infested place in the world, but they're out there worship or praying and bathing in it, thinking that they're getting some sort of uh, ritual blessing by doing so, 
make a trek to the river and get a, a, a for a pilgrimage and be bad, uh, bathed in that, baptized in that, and uh, middle of the garbage and the filth. Do you realize, uh, and then at, when you're dead, they want to cremate you and scatter your ashes into the Ganges River, where thousands and thousands of other people are showing up every day to bathe themselves or to cremate their loved ones. And you see these videos, and you check it out on the internet, uh, people with funeral pyres burning their loved one's body up and down the edge of that river so that they can eventually toss the ashes uh, or the carcass, the bones, back into the river as an offering to the Brahma and different gods they worship. Uh, several years ago, they, they stopped, and then they've started it again about 10 years ago. Um, they have flesh-eating turtles that they have had to import to swim up and down that river, consuming the leftover flesh of people whose bodies weren't completely cremated. They ran out of firewood, they ran out of time, but um, so these fish have uh, been swimming up and down the river, um, eating uh, flesh of partially decomposed bodies uh, who were cremated along the edge of the Ganges. So I think the the um, Hindus uh, have um, topped the Egyptians for their worship of uh, cows. But so so if the uh, if the Israelites had worshipped uh, God by slaughtering cows as sacrifice, worshiping their God, that would have so offended the Egyptians to even see it, to know about it. You'd have had a war between the people. So Moses said, we can't do that here because that would be an offense to the, to the uh, Egyptians. And then a second reason he refused Pharaoh's deal was it wasn't what God had commanded. It wasn't what God had commanded. Probably more important than worrying about the Egyptians' reaction. This was not what God had commanded. The Lord told Moses to bring his people out of Egypt. God had told Moses to bring the Israelites out of Egypt, not partially, not almost, to bring them out of Egypt, and uh, that's what he was su supposed to do. That's what God expected him to do. Uh, anything less than would be a compromise, it would have been disobedience to God. If he compromised the plain unmistakable command of God at all, you are stating a number of things by your actions. You are saying that God is not to be obeyed exactly as he specifies. You're basically deciding that his words are not that critical. Uh, also, you're telling the world around you, uh, my God really is no better than anyone else's God. That's what you're saying is, the word of my God is no better, has no more power than anyone else's God. You're also saying, God will save me because he loves me, but he's very flexible and lets me make my own decisions in some of these things. And fourthly, you're saying, Belonging to God really makes no change. It, it, it affects no change in my life. Nothing's changed. I don't have to uh, obey exactly as I've been told to obey. If he had taken that deal to just stay here and not worry about anything else, 
he would have been declaring those things to the world around him. Uh, deal number two, um, why don't you stay close by? You don't have to go that far. Moses had said about three days' journey. Um, there in Exodus 8, verse 28, uh, he said, if you have to go, don't go very far. This was the second deal. Uh, likewise, Satan tells Christians, uh, let's make a deal. Go ahead and become a Christian. Don't go too far with it. Don't get carried away with it. And that's what a lot of that's how a lot of new believers proceed through the rest of their lives. Someone leads them to the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's no doubt that they had trusted Christ to save them. They trusted in the blood of Christ to wash away their sins by faith, but they've never grown. They've never, they go to some church that doesn't encourage them to grow. Can't imagine that. Someone who gets a paycheck from his respective or her respective church these days, somebody gets a paycheck supposedly representing God and speaking the words of God, leading the congregation to God, and um, doesn't know Jesus Christ himself. And that's act actually true. But a lot of people, uh, people who so-called ministers, but they don't know God themselves. I don't know why that is. How can that be? And yet it is. I, have been, I would venture to say Satan has more ministers uh, busy um, in the world than the Lord Jesus does. There are probably more quote-unquote ministers of some sort representing Satan because they don't know Christ at all uh, than those who do know the Lord Jesus Christ. And even half of those who do know Jesus Christ, maybe more than half who are saved, they're not representing him very well. They choose a different new translation of the Bible about every year and a half because a new one is offered to them. These Christian publishing companies, they'll, offer, they'll send you a sample of their new product and let you read it and sample it and, and see how well you like it, hoping you'll buy it and stock on the back of your pews with it and recommend it to everybody. That's another problem in modern Christianity. Number one, you have no hymn books that you can refer to, the, the lyrics of some great songs, because everything's up on the big screen. And number two, you don't even need to bring a Bible to church because the, the church decides to supply them in the back of the pews for you. What do you need to do? And now, with everything being broadcast online, live streaming, you don't even have to leave. Just stay home and just tell your minister the next time he's, oh yeah, we've, we've been watching every week. What does he know? What does he care? But... Um, Just stay close by. Everything will be okay. Likewise, Satan tells Christians, um, let's make a deal. Go ahead and be a Christian, but don't take it too far. Don't get carried away with it. Satan wants you to go ahead and be a Christian. But don't start doing all of these Christian churchy things. Don't start singing those song, corny songs they sing at church. Um, and I don't want to see you reading that Bible around the house and uh, worrying about whether you need a haircut or clean yourself up a little bit more than you used to. Um, any number of things. Don't start talking like a Christian and mentioning Jesus Christ. Why do you have to mention God everywhere we go? Why do you have to mention Jesus Christ or your love for God and your love for the Lord Jesus 
and uh, the forgiveness of your sins. Peter also asks, or in the New Testament, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. The truth is, a believer who is sold out to Jesus Christ, wants to prove it with his life, becomes a threat to Satan. If, if Satan catches you reading your Bible faithfully, consistently, uh, if he catches you praying, talking to God, talking uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting the leading of the Holy Spirit, if he catches you doing any number of things that reflect well on God and the kindness of God and the mercy of Jesus Christ, you become a threat to him. What's the old expression? Satan trembles, trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Well, that's very true. Look at uh, chapter 10. And for time's sake, we won't read it, but you can turn to, pay, uh, to uh, Exodus 10 and verses 7 through 11. Um, we don't need to read it for time's sake today. But deal number three, uh, why don't you be fair to your children, fair to your family? All right, if you men want to go worship, fine. But uh, you don't need to impose all this on your elderly parents, uh, your children, your wives. This would be great hardship for them to pick up and leave um, along with all of your herds and cattle. Uh, that's a big enough job. But then have to look after your wife and children and look after your elderly uh, family members. This would be very difficult and a difficult strain on them. Leave them behind and just go worship. Trust us. They'll be safe here. Yeah, right. As soon as you leave, they'll, um, they'll be dead out of punishment. Or they'll be tortured as uh, your incentive to turn around and come back and not to run away. I was surprised when my uh, brother and sister-in-law recently moved out of California and they drove to Kentucky uh, to move there. And they showed, showed me a few pictures of the uh, landscape, very, very pretty place. And uh, thank the Lord, they found a, a good King James Bible-believing church, dispensational in their doctrine, eternal security, etc. Not charismatic at all, none of that stuff. And I'm very happy uh, for them finding that church. They seem s uh, just entirely overjoyed. But um, I think they, the little house they've been living in next door as caretakers, they, I think they left on a, they leave on a Sunday. I think they left on a Sunday and uh, planned to arrive back there at their new place by Wednesday. That's a lot of driving for husband and wife in two separate cars. But uh, I want to tell my brother, you don't, you don't know this, but um, some of the church men here to, decided to rehab that house. I said, they, they, I want to tell my brother, they had that house gutted um, <laughs> inside uh, before you even got back to Kentucky. This is how quickly they began to act to uh, rehab and repair the house next door. Um, some things can be done very quickly when you've got a mind to do so. But deal number three was, uh, why don't you be fair to your family? This idea, and it's become a modern American 
um, perversion. And it's the idea that you don't drag your kids to church. Don't force the rest of them to go to church. Let them make up their own mind when they get older. Let them decide what they want to do with God or with church or with the Bible and Christ. Do you know something? That's a recipe uh, to produce atheists. You're going to produce atheist or at least an agnostic who wants nothing to do with your God. When kids are small at a certain age, uh, that's the time to force them. You have to force them because you don't want them growing up, changing their mind, saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. It's for their own good. And if they know what you're doing is because you love them. There's some hard times, inconveniences uh, along the way, um, but it's because you love them. You have to force them to do what's right. You wouldn't want to... to let young babies decide um, when they're going to eat, when they're going to... Uh, and, and they can't get to the food. You have to force some people to do what's right. You know why we have certain kinds of punishment? Prisons, institutions for women and men. It's because there are certain lessons they need to learn, and they didn't learn them when they were growing up. They didn't learn them when their mom and dad were raising them, if they raised them. That's why you have so much crime, and young men go from drop out, dropping out to a prison, and they don't do much with their lives in between, because there was no supervision. No one was riding roughshod over them, make them do what was right and what was important. If a parent, a Christian parent, or parents that profess to be Christians, true believers, don't train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, uh, they don't train up a child in the way he should go, because when he's old, he'll not depart from it, Proverbs 22, 6, thinking, well, I'm going to let them decide when they get old enough. That child's going to decide he doesn't want God. Very seldom do you hear of some kid getting 18, 19, 20 years old and uh, deciding, you know what, I think what I need is uh, more spirituality. I need Jesus Christ. I need the Bible. I need Generally speaking, people don't think that way. At that age, you're thinking of yourself what I can get, how much money I can make, and so on. You're not thinking of your spiritual needs. But um, someone who says, I'll, I won't raise my kids at church, Sunday school. I won't raise them hearing the Bible read and taught to them by Sunday school teacher or by their parents. What you end up doing is you steal one soul from God. Secondly, you add one soul to Satan. Thirdly, you are dishonoring God by that conduct. And you're giving Satan a little part of yourself. Train up a child in the way he should go. <clears throat> if you train up a child in the way he should go, um, by the same token, aren't you also demonstrating to that child how you should go? Sure you are. Deal number four, and try to bring this to a close here. You don't need everything, do you? You don't need to take all this stuff with you, all these possessions, flocks, herds, you don't need to take it all. Pharaoh said, let's make a deal. If you want to go, then go. But you won't be needing 
all your stuff, will you? And uh, Moses said, we have to go because we have to take everything. Because God's told us, come out into the wilderness and sacrifice to him, hold a feast to him, but we don't know exactly what is going to be needed. So we need to take all that we have. And a wonderful, and in a great parallel, a Christian needs to offer everything to God. Everything you have needs to be offered to the Lord God. Whatever you can give to Him, whatever can be yielded to His use and His service, that's what God wants. Doesn't mean you have to give it all up, but you have to be willing to. You have to be willing to. God may allow uh, some Christians, maybe some of you one day, to possess great wealth and accumulate great possessions. Uh, if it's yielded to Him, if whatever you have is yielded to serve Him and offered to please Him, then God's pleased with that. Let me bring this to a, to a close today. You can't compromise a little bit of holiness. You can't compromise a little bit of virtue. You can't compromise a little bit of obedience from those things God has clearly asked, clearly stated. If you miss, if you neglect any of it, you might as well neglect all of it. I don't know how many times, and I'm going to say hundreds, hundreds of times over my years in my secular job, I've heard ministers tell congregations at funerals, what does God want of you? He wants you to do your best. Catholic priests are notorious for this. They don't know the gospel, and so they recommend you know, letting your conscience be your guide, uh, doing your best, and living life to the fullest. That's a real popular phrase. Living life to the fullest. What in the world does that mean? Living life to the fullest. Jeffrey Dahmer lived his life to the fullest. Is that what God wanted? Was that sufficient to get him into heaven? No. And uh, likewise, so many Christians think they can compromise with the world, compromise with standards, compromise with influences. Um, you don't want your kid babysat all day long watching television. You want to minimize their exposure to that stuff. If your um, uh, penchant is to look at the internet all day long so you can get caught up in on different news channels and so forth, even if it's not television, uh, your kids see how devoted you are to watching the video screen, your laptop or cell phone, and uh, they, they may not be able to phrase it or articulate it yet, but they know when dad or mom are spending way too much time in front of the computer and they're not spending any time with them. You think, well, they're not that sophisticated. Yes, they are. You want to bet? Kids pick up on a lot more than we give them credit for or want to admit. 